The next talk that we're going to have is actually Neil Mava. Uh, Neil is one of the semi-finalists for the Hackaday Prize 2015, working on a project which did uh, haptic feedback. It was a combination of uh, ultrasonic sensors providing haptic feedback to provide a vision system to the blind. Really, really cool project, really, really compelling technology, and again, with a really strong sort of social interest, uh, social purpose. So with that, I'll turn it over to Neil. Neil. All right. All right, thanks everyone. So, okay. Um, we're going to be talking about haptic feedback. So, haptic feedback is really just a broadly defined term. It's all about vibrations, communicating information to humans through the sense of touch. Now, I'm going to be talking about the theory a little bit because I don't think we have enough coverage of that in, in Wikipedia or on the internet, but we're mostly going to be focusing on how you're going to use this knowledge to build better products uh, in your hacking hours. So, let's get started. Um, so why haptics? Well, basically, haptics are the next big step in HCI, human-computer interaction. It's a really natural way to work with users because it's something that they just feel and it's not really processed through any sort of uh, high abstraction layer. When you think about eyes or visual UIs, you really have to think about the amount of processing that the brain does to make a picture or like an image of wavelengths into a complete idea or an image in your mind. Whereas haptics are very, very natural and innate, and it's really one of the older senses that we have sitting around. So uh, haptics are probably one of the easiest ways to work with users and have them get what you're doing quickly. The other thing that haptics allow you to do is get really fast feedback with the user. The reason is because if you think about it again about the brain's processing loop, there's about a 200 millisecond delay or latency between an image showing up on screen and you understanding that. So having haptics lets you actually skip the brain's processing entirely and build muscle memory with your users, which if you're building a product that's going to be used day in, day out with your users, that's going to be a huge deal in terms of increasing their enjoyment and use of the device. And finally, Apple's doing it, and so is everyone else, so we might as well hop in on that and uh, you know, don't get left behind in the next generation of HCI. So let's talk about the human body first. Um, what we're working with is most commonly the hand. Now, the hand is just chosen for a lot of reasons, most, mostly because it's really the most innervated part of the body in terms of having the most sensory receptors. But uh, it's also one of the easiest ways to work with users. You generally think of your hands as being your output agents to the world. So when you, if we lock ourselves into the hand, we have a couple different areas that we can target when we are thinking about haptic feedback to the user. Um, most commonly, it's the fingertips, because the fingertips have the highest density of sensory receptors per square millimeter of skin than any other part of your body. The downside is your fingers are very expensive real estate in that uh, you use them for a lot of different things, if you haven't noticed. Um, if you try to put something on the user's fingertip, you better be really, really useful. So as a compromise, we've started to move towards the wrist or the palm area. You might notice that a lot of people wear watches nowadays. So that's considered fair game in terms of having a space to work with the user. And it's, it's generally a good balancing ground between having sensitivity as well as being able to stay out of the way most of the time. And finally, if you're building a device that requires the user's full attention, like say a steering wheel or maybe a bike handle, then you might as well go for the palms and require that the user really grip onto the device to to, um, engage with them. So again, you have options, but um, as, a, as a hacker, you're really going to be pick, picking usually the fingertips or the wrist because either sensitivity or staying out of the way and being a wearable device. So what happens underneath the skin? This is the part that really doesn't get enough coverage. Um, Touch is a very complex sense. It's not as simple as just buzzing a motor and having the user feel that. That's pretty qua qualitative haptic feedback and then it's a binary off or on. And that's what most of our phones do nowadays, right? We either know that we got a message or an email by the fact, simple fact of having a vibration. That's not very useful though. We want to move towards quantitative haptic feedback, which means we want to convey some sort of uh, scaling information to the user, some sort of data that they can uh, figure out based on the pattern that we give them or maybe the sensation that we're able to deliver to the user. So for that, we need to think about what actually happens underneath the skin. Now, I'm not going to bore you with a whole lot of bio, but you should know that there are four different types of neuroreceptors in the skin that 
actually give you your sense of touch. And I'm not going to go into details on them, but they all have essentially different bandpass-ish filters that let them sense different frequencies of vibration. This is going to become very important because it turns out that uh, our brain is really just mixing and matching these different filters to understand the difference between sandpaper and, and satin, or like cotton and water. This is really the key, um, just having different vibrations mixed together. Uh, you can think about maybe a uh, higher order function, for example, mixing a lot of different vibrations together to emulate, ultimately, some haptic feedback sensation. So having control over these specific bands, the 5 to 15 hertz band, 200 to 300 hertz, and 30 to 50 hertz, gives you a lot of control over what the user feels. It's crazy to think about, but imagine if we could, through a simple motor that's operating very precisely, actually emulate senses like the feel of aluminum, or the feel of metal, um, or the feel of even carpet. Um, it's it's possible, not there yet, but we're, we're really going to be working towards that in the future. So understanding this is pretty key, and we're going to talk more about how we're going to actually use this information uh, in, our, in building a product out of this. So that's the high-level explanation. The, uh, so the skin is looking for essentially a bunch of different bands of frequencies of vibration, and from that it builds a picture of you know, what are we touching, what are we feeling. So let's manipulate that. Let's hack into the human body's sensation. Um, what are our options to interface with the user? Well, essentially, it comes down to spinning metal counterweights on a shaft, aka a motor. So right now, we have two major options that are used by most manufacturers. We have the ERM, or eccentric rotating mass, which is what I just described, a spinning mass on a motor. And that's kind of primitive. It works OK, but the catch is that it's really sort of not very precise. Um, and if we want to do like really fine feedback sensations, we don't have enough resolution with that. A couple of the problems are that frequency, which is what we really want to control, remember, it's not just a question of like buzzing and having the user feel it, but having them feel a specific frequency of vibration. And the problem with motors, ERMs, is that the frequency is tied to amplitude, because if you want a harder vibration, you just spin the motor faster. That's not really that good for us. The other problem is we have a lot of latency in terms of starting up the motor and starting and making it stop again. So we don't really get very crisp pulses if that's what we're after. But the upside is, for hackers like us, it's really simple to work with. We just toss it on a board, have a MOSFET driving it, and there you go. Simple drive circuitry, nothing too nothing too fancy. With LRAs, though, we have a lot more control, because LRAs are fundamentally different in the way that they operate. Linear resonant actuators require a really specific AC drive frequency. And what they do is they actually like, rotate a little mass that just vibrates uh, along a single axis. And uh, through that, we're able to get really precise control over vibrations. The problem is, that, as you imagine, is very complicated. It requires a lot of uh, watching the motor's back EMF to figure out how fast it's moving and driving it at a very specific, a specific resonant frequency to make sure that we're getting the most out of our motors. So we usually outsource that to a driver chip. So again, these are our options. But um, as a hacker, you probably want to start with the easier one. So let's do that. Let's say we want to build a haptic feedback system into our product. Uh, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to start with an ERM because that's an easy thing to work with. Uh, we would start by just tossing it into a circuit with either an H bridge or just like a low side transistor, like a MOSFET. And um, you're going to want to just drive it on and off depending on what your haptic feedback signal is. Now, one of the key innovations that a lot of people miss is that you don't want to just drive the motor on and off to indicate uh, that something has happened. That, that only gives you two possible states. What you want to do is start building a system that's like PPM, not pulse width modulation, which you're, I'm sure you all are, fam are familiar with, but pulse precession modulation. What that means is we're going to send consistent pulse widths uh, of essentially just sort of little buzzes to the user that might be just about 50 milliseconds of on time with the motor. Those little pulses add up over time, and we've we vary the frequency of those pulses to communicate something to the user. It's almost like the user has a, little, a secondary heartbeat on their wrist, for example, that speeds up or slows down in response to some event. Now, this actually improves the resolution we get with the user quite a bit. Um, it's hard to say exactly how much, and it depends what the user, who the user is. For example, I work with the blind a lot, and for the blind, this is really, really the next big thing in terms of building HCIs with for them. Um, they really, their timing circuitry, if you will, for touch is much better than ours, and uh, essentially they're able to distinguish quite a range of sensory feedback when we use this sort of pulse precession modulation. Now, the other problem is that this doesn't give us a whole lot of range to work with. If you're really fast, um, your pulses will sort of deteriorate into a continuous vibration form because remember that like we have a lot of latency in starting and stopping the motor. So the maximum frequency that we can push to the user is about, say, 20 hertz. And the minimum frequency, there is one because if you're just tapping the user once every five seconds, the user starts to forget uh, about the taps and is no longer able to put them together into a signal. 
So uh, with that being said, you sort of just throw this into your Arduino code, for example, and say, OK, I'm going to have a linear map between some input data metric. It could be temperature. It could be, it could be distance. It could be um, GPS location. And we tie that to pulse frequency through, through a simple linear mapping function. And this actually works really well, uh, surprisingly well, for how crude it is. But uh, the key innovations here are just that we're actually going to be pulsing the user a little tap system and uh, having that map to some sort of input data. And with a little bit of training, say an hour or two, you're able to get pretty good resolution. And um, for example, I tried this with my project Pathfinder, which is a sonar system to let the blind navigate environments. And with this first order system, I was able to get about, say, 5 to 10 centimeter resolution over a 5 meter range with about two hours of training. So it works, but there's still work to be done. So what do we do to move forward from this kind of haptic feedback? And what are the companies in this space doing now to make this a real thing? Well, basically, we start by working more with the motors, and we think more about what is the user going to be feeling when we pulse them a little tap of, of electromagnetic feedback. Um, so what we can start doing is actually actively breaking the motor. And this is a couple of things. Actively breaking first increases the sharpness of our wave. I, I, did mention, I did show a square wave, but really it's not going to look like that in terms of the amplitude or the feedback that the user feels. The, the pulses are not as sharp because the motor has inertia in starting and stopping. So um, if we actively break, we are able to get crisper pulses and at the same time save power. We save power because active braking is actually more like regenerative braking in this case. So you're able to recharge the battery from uh, the stopping of the inertia of your motor. And for a wearable device, this could mean a lot of savings. For me, for example, I know that uh, the wearable systems uh, will spend a lot of their power on just haptic feedback if that's the primary mode of contact with the user. The other thing is, that a, if we can, use, we can use a more advanced function to relate distance and, or so whatever your input metric is, and your output, which is the vibration frequency. Um, so I did a lot of experimentation with this. And you might have heard that a lot of the things in the human body are logarithmic in, in nature. They're not linear in the sense that we don't perceive a 2x increase in loudness in terms of decibels as a 2x increase in you know, intensity for uh, our brain. Or, or the other alternative is for brightness. It's not a linear scale in terms of absolute amplitude. We have a lot of processing filters built into the brain that get in the way, if you will. So uh, if we start to leverage that, we can start building functions that are, say, three, third order, fourth order, whatever, and we start training those to users. We have them sit down with us for a little bit, uh, for, say, a couple hours or so, and we start tailoring the function. We, we move this curve around until it matches what they feel. We give them a very natural way of feeling distance or temperature, whatever your input vector may be. Um, the reason the curve slopes upward like this is because when you get further away, when you increase that pulse frequency and you start stretching out your little your taps, um, you need to have greater swings in terms of you know how different each step is to get the user to, to stay on the same page with you and have them understand what's going on. Because again, the human body, it doesn't necessarily have the same resolution when you move to longer time scales and uh, you start to lose the user's attention a little bit. So again, this is up to the user. You have them train with you for some time and you can get better results that way. Now, when you go to LRAs, those linear resonant actuators, you can start doing a lot of other crazy stuff, like, again, messing with the frequencies to sort of play with the user's perception of the touch. Um, you can also, in this case, actually change the amplitude of the pulse, because you couldn't do that with ERMs because that would change your frequency. But with LRAs, when you have that frequency locked into place, you can start playing with amplitude. And again, this, this is actually the key to uh, building more advanced haptic interfaces, because uh, a a what it actually comes down to is frequency control. Now, what the industry is doing is quite different. Apple just came out with the Force Touch system a couple of months back. And whether you like Apple or not, you have to admit, their system is pretty good. It really does emulate a mouse click very well. And that's just the first order implementation that they've been working on. Now, how they do that is they have this a metal bar, essentially, with a bunch of electromagnets, four exactly, uh, spaced up on it. And what they do is they send an alternating current through the electromagnets to have it vibrate at a very fixed frequency. Um, now, that frequency is, is very complex, too. It has multiple components. So we have, they probably have a 5 to 15 hertz component to trigger uh, one sensor and in your hand, and another one to trigger the 200 to 300, and the 30 to 50. And so they broke up frequency into bands based on what they know about the biology of the human hand, and were able to emulate touches that way. Now, no one has done this before because that's relatively hard to do. And also, this system, if you think about the efficiency of it, is really bad. It's not very good at in terms of turning electricity into motion. But because Apple thought outside the box, in a sense, and they went for frequency control over amplitude, they were able to build a system that has much finer control over uh, the frequencies we feel, and therefore were able to emulate touch a lot better. So what does this mean for us? Well, 
Again, if it comes down to frequency control, we don't have to fight with the biggest, baddest names in the industry to build more efficient integrated devices. We need to start hacking. We need to start building devices that are creative in a way that, uh, in terms of producing vibration, because we never know what will work. Um, maybe you can develop the next sort of metal bar system that uh, it has better frequency control than the previous ones. Or maybe you just build a special type of motor that's optimized for one frequency band. It doesn't matter what you do. The point is we need a lot of creative minds working on this problem because we haven't seen a lot of innovation here. I only mentioned two options, but there really should be 200. Um, we really want to see the different ways we can work with the human body. And it doesn't have to be motors either. You can start with electronic, uh, electronic stimulation of nerve cells directly. Um, a whole lot of crazy stuff exists in this space, and I wish they would get, would get more attention, but we haven't seen it yet. And I hope that yet yeah, it's going to be picked up by some of you guys. Uh, haptic feedback really is the next generation of HCI, and it's going to be such an amazing space in five, 10 years. Let's not get left behind. It's not that hard to get started with. So I encourage all of you to start thinking about maybe instead of using a display on your project, uh, or if you have a wearable project, start throwing on a motor and you know, have some code to uh, you know, pulse the user some sort of notification system, and then turn that into a quantitative feedback system. And the stepping stones are in place right now. That's why I was able to do it. Um, the next big steps, though, are going to take a lot more effort. I'm going to continue researching the space, looking at neuroscience and working back up to engineering. But really, we should all just be throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. So. Uh, that's pretty much the end of my talk. Thank you all for listening, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Now that's going to be pretty close to a couple milliseconds on that order uh, in terms of getting the, the mass to oscillate. The problem is that has issues with amplitude and it's really hard to develop in a device that wasn't designed around that. So piezoelectric modulation usually involves, for example, if you design it with your phone in mind, you would have a a large surface area behind the battery, for example, of some piezoelectric material, and you drive that. And it also requires high voltage driving circuitry, which we generally try to avoid with wearables. Um, so there's a lot of issues with that, but I wish, again, more devices like that would exist. But yes, that would be probably the lowest latency that we can get today. Um, you can ask more questions over there in the Q&A okay. area underneath the Tindy poster. That was amazing. Thanks, Good guys. job. Yeah.